This is a follow up to my previous video where I show that Cirrus, which is located here from the perspective of the Moon, will be occulted by the Earth on September 22nd just after 1800 hours UTC time. As you can see, Cirrus passes directly behind the center of the Earth and then out the other side. What makes this occultation even more interesting is not only does Cirrus pass behind the center of the Earth, it also appears to be at its maximum on the prime meridian. Determining the correct position of the prime meridian was one of the purposes of Captain Cook's Venus transit observations in Tahiti in June of 1769. Even more interesting is this line you could draw through the center of the moon, through the center of the earth, and through the center of Cirrus happens to fall in the same longitudinal direction as Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion, which is of course directly above the blacked out area in Google Sky. Now if we wind the clock back to December 26, 2004 at 12.58 a.m. UTC, the magnitude 9.1 earthquake off the coast of Sumatra, which caused a tsunami that claimed more than a quarter of a million lives, we'll find that from the perspective of the Earth, the Moon was in the same longitudinal position as Cirrus is on September 22, 2012. And on September 11, 2001 at 8.46 a.m. Eastern Time, the time of the initial attacks in New York City, we find the Moon in almost exactly the same longitudinal position. Now if we were to look from Cirrus back towards the Earth, we'll see that the Earth is located in the direction of the galactic core over the so-called dark rift of the Milky Way. In the same longitudinal position as the Sun would appear to be from the perspective of the Earth one day before the much-hyped galactic alignment of December 21, 2012. So how unique is this Cirrus occultation? Well, Cirrus has an orbital period of 4.6 years, and the Moon has an inclined orbit, and the orbit precesses the period of about 18.6 years. Let's do some quick calculations. We've got 18.6 times 4.6, and we've got 85 years. So we could get an occultation every 85 years. But of course this is happening in the equinox period. And the equinoxes are known for the aurora events, as well as king tides and an uptick in earthquakes. So we'll multiply that by 6. And now we've got 513, which is pretty close to the Bennu cycle written about by Herodotus. The myth being the Bennu, also known as the Phoenix, would come to Heliopolis to build its nest out of myrrh and frankincense at the top of an obelisk before bursting into flames and then out of the ashes would rise the new phoenix which would carry the bones of its parent back to the city of gold. Getting back to our calculations, if we want to have an alignment for the dark rift, give or take a degree, we're going to have to multiply that by 182.5 93,000 years. Well, this is not the best way to do this sort of calculation. Surely we can use a an astronomy program, such as Celestia. Unfortunately we can't do that because the only orbital elements available for Cirrus are for that of an asteroid. And if you were to take that back 100 years, you'd find that the margin of error is so great that the results are completely meaningless. All you can really say is that this particular galactic alignment is an extremely rare event. So why should we care about Cirrus? After all, it's smaller than our moon and it's two and a half times as far away from us as the sun. Well, the position of all major planets in our solar system is a function of what's called the Golden Ratio. In fact, all things in nature seem to be based on the Golden Ratio. Except, when we look for the planet between Mars and Jupiter, all we have is the asteroid belt. And Cirrus is the largest object in the asteroid belt. Perhaps it is the moon of a planet that was once there. Can a conjunction between the Earth and Moon and another planet in our solar system affect us here on Earth? Well, yes it can. This is a chart showing the degrees of difference between Jupiter and the Moon. At the top it's 180 degrees difference, at the bottom it's a zero degree difference. And we're looking at sea level data now 
from the Chatham Islands in the South Pacific. And as you can see, there's a very strong correlation. And this correlation spans almost 12 years, covering the entire orbit of Jupiter. And yet Jupiter is much smaller than the Sun, and on average it's five times further away. Well, how about earthquakes? Well, yes, the magnitude 8.8 .8 off the coast of Chile in February 27, 2010 is one example. Well, how about objects outside of our solar system? For example, when the Earth and Moon align with the galactic core, or in the other direction towards Betelgeuse, which is in the same direction as the blacked out area in Google Sky, and perhaps the location of the dead star, determining the location of which was apparently one of the objectives of the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions. Well, when we look at sea level data in the Northern Pacific, we find there's actually a very strong correlation between the maximum change in sea levels and the alignment between the Earth and Moon in the galactic core. Except, in, unlike the case with Jupiter, the peaks occur at both 180 degrees and 0 degrees. In other words, whether the Moon aligns to the galactic core or to Betelgeuse. Well, how about earthquakes? Well, we only have to look back to April 11 of this year when we had the magnitude 8.6 in northern Sumatra, followed by an 8.2 in almost the same location as the Boxing Day tsunami earthquake back in 2004. However, this year it was the Moon in the direction of the galactic core and the Earth in the direction of Orion. So are there any recent examples of earthquakes or sea level anomalies involving conjunctions with Cirrus? Of course there are earthquakes every day, but we're only going to consider big earthquakes. Earthquakes of magnitude 7.5 and above, because these are the earthquakes that form these strong correlations with celestial alignments. Well, we only have to look back as far as July 6, 2011, when there was a magnitude 7.6 earthquake near the Kermadec Islands, just north of New Zealand. It also coincided with a significant sea swell off the coast of New Zealand. It also coincided with a drop in sea level of 3 metres, as recorded by one of the buoys in the northern Pacific. However, the effect of the partial occultation on September 9 was tiny, if there was anything at all. Celestial alignments are quite common, but large earthquakes are not. So what is the missing factor that determines whether or not a large earthquake will occur on one of the main celestial alignments? Earthquakes release energy, and large earthquakes release a lot of energy sometimes the equivalent of thousands of Hiroshima bombs. The energy has to come from somewhere. It's not like fiat currency which is printed out of thin air by the banksters. The most obvious source of this energy is the Sun. It turns out that when a long period comet passes near the ecliptic, the orbital plane of the Earth, and its tail comes in parallel alignment to the Earth and Moon, we are likely to get a large earthquake on the next major celestial alignment. Last year's passage of Comet Alanin provided many examples of this phenomenon up until the point where it lost its tail. Why does the Moon act in this way? The Moon is in a rotational lock around the Earth with the same face always in the direction of the Earth. It is also outside of Earth's magnetosphere, the protective magnetic shield around the Earth, and therefore in full blast of the solar wind and cosmic radiation. So its electrical charge should be very different from that of the surface of the Earth. But as we know, opposite charges attract, and there would be a charge gradient from the Earth-facing side to the far side of the Moon. Over time, this may have resulted in the crystalline structure of the rocks becoming polarized in a direction radiating outwards from the Earth, transforming the Moon into something like a giant crystal radio transceiver. As a side note, Sir Isaac Newton, the grandfather of gravity, found that the Moon is too small and did not have enough mass to account for its far greater influence on the tides than that of the Sun. The electrical charge differential between the Moon and the oceans could well be the answer. So while on the one hand, the position of the Moon is a trigger for large magnitude earthquakes, if it weren't for the Moon, perhaps the environment here on Earth would be more like that of Venus, which is extremely hot, and of course it has no Moon. So the Moon is in effect a giant safety valve for the excess energy that collects on the Earth from the Sun and other celestial sources. During a period of high earthquake activity in 2011, two YouTube users happened to be independently filming the moon and both recorded what appeared to be flashes of light. In my opinion, they had accidentally filmed sparks of energy that had been discharged from the Earth. So are there any long period comets passing through the ecliptic at this time? No, not that I am aware of. So for that reason, I hadn't considered the unusual alignment with Cirrus as anything more than a celestial marker post, an interesting rare event that happened to coincide with a couple of festivals on the Prime Meridian, that being the Alchemy Festival, north of London, and a performance of Jesus Christ Superstar at the O2 Stadium. However, there was an alert released yesterday from NOAA, forecasting a geomagnetic storm from the Sun that will impact the Earth on September 22nd, just before the Earth occults with Cirrus. 
This changes everything. We now have a powerful source of energy that coincides with this rare galactic alignment, a perfect storm. So what is likely to happen? NOAA are predicting aurorae will be visible as far south as Canada and Alaska. However, that doesn't take into account the fact that the Earth will occult Sirius almost immediately after the peak of the geomagnetic storm. Depending upon the imbalance on energy imparted on the Earth and the Moon, it appears quite likely that there will be significant earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and possibly high tides in both the South Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. In my opinion, it is the tidal effect that is likely to be of more concern than the earthquakes. With the accelerating migration of Earth's north magnetic pole in recent years, it raises the possibility that a shift in the oceans might upset the axial rotation of the Earth, in a worst case scenario leading to a destabilizing wobble and possible geographical pole shift. As far as flood events are concerned, they are more common than acknowledged by mainstream science. For example, 60 years ago we have the discovery of what appears to be Noah's Ark, the remains of a petrified wooden boat 300 cubits long in the foothills of Mount Ararat, on a mountain known locally as Doomsday Mountain, in a region called the Valley of the Eight. We also have the lifetime's work of Emmanuel Velikovsky, who found evidence of a disturbance in the Earth's rotation at the time Moses is said to have led the exodus from Egypt as the Red Sea parted, finding confirmation in an Egyptian papyrus and historical references from many places on Earth, each describing the event as it affected them in their respective geographical locations. The Babylonians, the tribes of Sudan, the Finns, the Greeks, the Peruvians and the American Indians all have traditions of a long night accompanying a catastrophe which the Earth did not survive. Further east, the Iranians saw the sun suspended several days in the sky. In China, it is said in the reign of Emperor Yahu, the sun did not set for a number of days and all the forests burned. More recently, we have the oral history from the Aborigines in Australia who describe a catastrophic flood that swept across Australia as recently as 1500 years ago. And there is an account from elders of one Maori tribe in New Zealand who say their island of Hawaii sank into the Pacific 1,000 years ago during the passage of a large comet. Hawaii has never been located. As for September 22nd, there is also the possibility that the geomagnetic storm is going to be much more severe than expected. If its effect is anything like the Carrington event of 1859, the loss of power to all the currently active nuclear power stations will be like Fukushima times 331. The fallout from the meltdowns will slowly kill almost everyone. Perhaps that is a reason the elites, who have built deep underground military bases for themselves, also love to build these ticking time bombs. For whatever reason, prior to world changing events, there are always clues hidden in plain sight. We have just finished witnessing the overt New World Order celebrations at the 2012 Olympics, the Phoenix symbolism, along with the Dark Knight Rising shootings in Aurora, Colorado, just seven miles from the dumb under the Denver New World Airport, and more recently, what appears to be a calculated set of events setting the stage for World War III. To finish up, I'd like to quickly look back at two unusual scenes in the Doomsday Movie 2012, released on 11-11 in 2009. Note, September 22nd is 11 years and 11 days after the false flag of 9-11. There are two scenes that place unusual emphasis on the main character's watch. In the second such scene, the hands form perfect right angles and show the time as 7.22. Septem in Latin is 7. September in the pre-Julian Roman calendar was the 7th month, so could the time on the watch be referring to September 22nd. The hands on the watch are at perfect right angles, just as the Sun, Moon and Sirius will be on September 22nd. Our hand to the Sun, minute hand to the Moon, second hand to Sirius. Is this the galactic alignment mentioned in the opening scene? In the opening scene for this movie, the watch is actually stopped and the time is 9.27. Perhaps in this case, simply representing September 27 in our Gregorian calendar, indicating five days later. The actor says, I am a dead man, three times. The reason he says this is because he is late. He is dead. My take on the situation. Be sure you have at the very least a good supply of food and water. However, it could be a good time to grab the bug out bag and head for the hills. It looks like we really might have a storm coming, like we've never seen before. Thank you for watching. Heads up. Be safe.